Uh, actually, not, not too far from here. It's a, the uh, federal and Denver place. You know, like the federal yes, yeah, sure, of course. Theater, yes. kind of right by the yep, federal yep. theater. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I think there's a bunch yeah. of good uh, yeah. things. Yeah, it's a federal. I'm going to do one more time. Check one, check two, check one, check two. Uh, can you try again? Yeah. One, two, check one, two. Uh, I'm not hearing that. From oh, here? Check one? Yep. Okay. No, I hear
Well, welcome everybody. Thank you for coming. Uh, hello. <laughs> I was just uh, joking with David that there are a lot of Davids here. And literally right after I made that uh, quip, a uh, friend of mine, David, <laughs> came and introduced himself. So thank you, David and Davids, for coming. Uh, and especially our special speaker, David McPherson. Um, my name is Adam Grays. I'm a professor of the philosophy department, and I'm director of DeFi, the Denver Project for Humanistic Inquiry, which is the public humanities center here at MSU Denver. Um, we do events in conjunction with um, cultural institutions throughout the city. We have a couple events coming up next week that I quickly want to flag for you because our time frame for getting tickets out to the public um, is quickly uh, approaching the deadline for that. So uh, the Denver Film Festival, which I think kicks off this weekend, uh, we're doing two events uh, next week, one Monday night uh, at 7 o'clock. Uh, there's a film called A Night of Knowing Nothing. It won Best Documentary at the Cannes Film Festival. Uh, it's a documentary out of, out of India. And we have assembled a pretty interesting panel uh, of, of experts and scholars from uh, various uh, institutions of higher learning throughout the region. Uh, so yeah, so if you'd like to attend that, uh, please um, let me know. Uh, you can email us. Go to our website, actually, defi.org, O-R-G, uh, and you can find information on that. And then on Wednesday night, we have another uh, post-screening uh, panel discussion with a number of distinguished uh, guests, including David Fine, who the, is the general counsel of MSU Denver and who's here today. Um, and that film is called Ahed's Knee. It's a film uh, made by an Israeli filmmaker uh, who had a, a kind of a breakout hit by the name of Synonyms that came out a couple years ago. So that's kind of a more of a political film, I guess. Um, but anyway, so if any of you are interested in attending either of those screenings, DeFi can hook you up with some free tickets. Um, and the screenings themselves are over at the new AMC Theater at 9th and Colorado. So kind of over in the direction of Aurora. Well, it's my great pleasure and honor to uh, introduce today's speaker, uh, David McPherson, who is Associate Professor of Philosophy at Creighton University. He works in the areas of ethics, especially virtue ethics, uh, political philosophy, meaning of life, and philosophy of religion. He's author of a forthcoming book, The, the Virtues of Limits, uh, which is, of course, also the subject of today's talk. And is the book out already, or is it? See, the Brits are always a little bit ahead of us on these things. And I guess right now that's not a good thing. I was reading about their COVID booster shots. Anyway, so, um, and that's being published by Oxford University Press. Uh, and then he's also author of Virtue and Meaning, a Neo-Aristotelian Perspective, published by Cambridge in 2020. Wow. Um, so that's a uh, back-to-back, uh, pretty hefty uh, works back to back, um, as well as he, he's also the editor of Spirituality and the Good Life, Philosophical Approaches, also Cambridge University Press. He's president of Philosophers in, in Jesuit as Education, and he is also a co-founder of the Heartland Virtue Ethics Network. So uh, thank you so much, David, for coming. You're our first speaker since the beginning of the pandemic in March of 20. <laughs> 20, whenever that was. Um, yeah, exactly, 2007. Uh, so anyways, so yeah, so this is really exciting. And thank you all again for coming out for this. I know that um, life on campus hasn't been quite what it used to be, and we're hoping that you know things get a little better and we can try to build back. Um, build back better. Anyway, sorry not to. All right, thank you so much. All right, well, thank you so much, all of you, for coming out today. Thank Adam in particular. Also, uh, my friend Caleb Coho, who uh, can't be with us today because, fortunately, I don't know if I should reveal people's medical things, but uh, <laughs> he, he got COVID, but he's, he's, he's feeling well, so I'm, I'm happy to report that, but n unhappy or sad that he, he can't. Be. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't worry, don't judge him. All right. Um, yeah, so, and yeah, thanks, thanks to Adam. Uh, thanks for the nice introduction. Um, yeah, so this, this Virtues and Limits book is a shorter book. So uh, I, once the pandemic hit, I was like, I'm just going to throw myself into writing this book. And uh, so that, that, that helped me uh, stay sane. Um, yeah, so this book uh, obviously is called The Virtues of Limits. Uh, and uh, in some ways, I think it's a, a countercultural message that I'm seeking to offer. Uh, I will give you some examples of this. Um, 
You may have heard some of these expressions, having boundless aspirations, living without limits, right? Uh, no limits, that's the University of South Carolina's official motto, no limits. Um, and then there's this movie which I've never seen, but I thought, you know, it sort of <laughs> expresses a certain kind of ethos, limitless. Everything is possible when you open your mind, right? Um, now, uh, I don't think all of that's all bad. In fact, I think uh, the basic uh, premise or sort of starting point of my book is that there's something of a uh, uh, sort of ambigu ambiguity in the human condition uh, in that uh, part of being human, so in contrast to no limits, you can say know your limits, right? Um, so, in co uh, so the basic predicament here is that it is part of being human, be human beings that we seek to transcend limits, right? This is part of what it is to be human, right? We, we push ourselves, uh, and this is part of our potential for greatness, for, for achieving what's best in our humanity. So I don't want to deny sort of this, this aspect of, you know, that you know, sometimes we do want to transcend limits. Limits, transcending limits can, can be a very good thing. In fact, it can be part of what's best in our humanity, that we push ourselves to the next level, so to speak, right? Uh, however, the limit transcending feature of human life is also part of our potential downfall. Uh, when we fail to recognize proper limits in human life, right? Uh, we can fail to attain certain important human goods, uh, and we can fail to uh, avoid certain human evils, right? So how do we get it right is sort of the question. How do we avoid, uh, so we can both achieve the best in our humanity through transcending limits, but we can also become dehumanized in our failure uh, to, to recognize proper limits, right? And so the question is, how do we sort of thread the needle appropriately, right? How do we, how do we get it right? And so... This book uh, that I have coming out is an attempt to explore the place of limits within a well-lived human life. How do we get it right? Uh, and I develop uh, and defend what I call uh, the limiting virtues. So the, the title itself, The Virtues of Limits, sort of has a double meaning. In one sense, we think of the virtues of something as the benefits of it, right? The benefits of that thing. So there, there's benefits in recognizing limits in our lives, right? Uh, at the same time, virtues, if, you, if you're familiar with uh, sort of the, the uh, field of virtue ethics, uh, as it's called, going back to Aristotle, uh, is a focus on types of character traits that enable us to live well as human beings. What are those types of character traits that enable us to live well as human beings? And so I want to identify uh, certain virtues that we can call limiting virtues, that their, their function in large part is to help us to identify proper limits in human life. And so I'm going to talk about, today and in the book, I talk about uh, six what I call limiting virtues. So there's humility, uh, which I consider to be the master limiting virtue, reverence, moderation, contentment, neighborliness, and loyalty. So those are what I call the six limiting virtues. Now, all of the, I think all of the virtues, in fact, uh, you know, that we might recognize as the, those things that help us to live well as human beings, in fact, recognize limits. Uh, on my view, uh, the virtues are modes of being properly responsive to things of, of value or things of, of intrinsic goodness in the world, right? So justice can be considered a virtue, right? Justice is about giving people their due. Uh, it recognizes that people have, uh, have certain, uh, they deserve certain kinds of treatment, uh, I think in virtue of, of their basic human dignity, but also in part in, in membership in a particular uh, political community, being a citizen, uh, we have certain rights and responsibilities. So justice sort of pertains to getting that right. So it's properly responsive to the sort of claims of other people, what, what we owe to other people, right? Generosity in a different way is concerned with giving in an excellent way. Uh, courage is sort of facing up to hard circumstances. So all of those recognize limits in a way on our desires and choices because they tell us what we ought to do, right? So they're all, you know, any part of ethics in some sense is going to have a limiting function insofar as it constrains our desires and our choices, right? So in that sense, you know, it's, it's all limiting, uh, but ultimately hopefully enhancing at the same time. But I want to talk about these limiting virtues in, in a more, in a sort of more specific, uh, as more specific, having a more specific kind of concern. Uh, and they're concerned with recognizing limits in four different domains that I talk about in the book. Um, so the, there's four chapters of the book that they correspond to each of these types of limits. The first type of limits, which is up there on the screen, 
uh, is ex what I call existential limits. So an existential limit, uh, the term, we, we might think here of existence, right? It has to do with what exists, right? So this is the most general kind of limit that we can recognize that, that just have to do with what we might call the given world, the world as we have it, right? Does the world as we have it make certain claims upon us, right? And is there a proper way of relating to the given world or to what is, right? Uh, to existing value, things that, ha that are existing, that have value, do they make certain kinds of claims upon us? Uh, then the second kind of limit is moral limits. Now here, I'm, um, I mean, all of the limits I recognize in one sense could be considered moral limits because they're concerned with how we ought to live, right? But here in this chapter, I focus more on issues of character formation, how character formation begins from restraint on our desires, uh, learning to step back from our desires and ask what, it's, what is it good to desire. Uh, we, come, we come into the world with all kinds of desires, uh, and the, the, the idea of character formation is actually, it forms, it delimits, it, it, it uh, shapes our desires toward the good. Right? That's, that's the goal of, of uh, character formation. Um, and I also talk here about, uh, are there absolute limits in our willing? Are there any absolute moral prohibitions? Uh, and then I also talk about the possible limits on morality itself, particularly impartial morality. Are there limits on how far we can be expected to go uh, in, in doing things for others, right? Uh, some of you may have studied, for instance, the, uh, the, the moral philosophy of utilitarianism. You may know its basic idea is that we should promote the greatest happiness for the greatest number. So one of the sort of standard objections is it's too demanding. It requires us always to be, you know, seeking to promote the general happiness. Uh, and the, you know, we can never focus on our own happiness or the happiness of our friends and family. Uh, now, utilitarians, you know, they try to respond to that in a number of different ways. But um, the point is, the question here is, are there limits on to what extent things can be demanded of us uh, for the sake of some uh, universal moral concern? So I accept that we do have obligations to hum human beings as such, but how far are we expected to go on behalf of pursuing those obligations? Or you know, what are the extent of them, in other words, right? Because there's, there could be a problem where we ultimately you know, alienate ourselves from our own, the, our own deepest projects. So a philosopher named Bernard Williams has this classic critique of utilitarianism that says it's ultimately self-alienating. It, it, it alienates us from the projects and relationships that give our lives significance. It's ultimately dehumanizing, in other words, right? Um, so that's what I cover in the moral limits uh, chapter. Then I get into political limits. Uh, what are the you know uh, what are the bounds and bonds of political community? One of the big political divides of our age is between uh, sort of cosmopolitan outlook and a, a patriotic outlook, right? How should we think about the bonds and bounds of political community? Is patriotism a virtue? I argue uh, that. It, uh, on, on a certain understanding it is, and it's needed for democratic self-government, it's needed for uh, sort of supporting distributive justice, uh, needed for forms of belonging that are important to human beings, uh, although that's not uh, incompatible with criticizing one's country and working for its best. In fact, that should be what we'd expect if we love something and are loyal to it. So uh, then I get into a number of issues around distributive justice. Uh, you know, uh, should we be utopians or not? The role of political moderation in a polarized age. So lots of topics. We won't get into all of these topics today. I want to try to give more of a focus on uh, these six limiting virtues today. But the last chapter is on economic limits. Um, and uh, I think a lot of people are concerned with the problem of greed, or at least it's become, become aware of the problem of greed and, and the way that that uh, f uh, functions and ha has problems, uh, creates problems in human society and in, in individually as well. So there I argue for contentment as a virtue. Uh, and uh, I also uh, argue for um, a vision of economics going back to Aristotle. Aristotle, the, our term uh, for economics has root meanings or it comes from the Greek word uh, akoinom koinomia, uh, which often is translated as household management. Uh, so I, I call this home economics, not quite the you know the old class that you might have, you know someone might have taken in, in uh, you know K through 12 at some point, but uh, economics that enable us to be at home in the world, um, that rather than causing alienation, uh, help us to to find a way of belonging, contributing to our community, uh, and so forth. So 
Um, and then I end with a reflection on the Sabbath. The Sabbath, of course, traditionally in Jewish and Christian traditions is an important limit on our, our, our work activities. Um, I'll talk maybe a little bit more about that, but I suggest it's relevance for everyone. I think we live in a very sort of uh, harried and hurried society where we, we're going from one thing to the next, always busy, 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 and we don't know how to truly have leisure to, to not just you know, you know, watch Netflix or whatever, whatever the case may be, but how do we you know, uh, engage in a kind of appreciative, restful mode of existence, right? Uh, a contemplative mode of existence. Uh, Aristotle famously thought the, the, the chief good of human life was contemplation. Uh, it may seem you know, counterintuitive for some people, but for philosophers, I think it seems pretty intuitive. It sounds right. But maybe that's a philosopher's prejudice. Uh, but in any case, I, I, I uh, end the book with this discussion of the Sabbath, which I think can be seen as a kind of leisure in which contemplation has an important role to play. Okay, so that's a kind of bird's eye view, just sort of what, what the book is about. I want to get into... Um, <clears throat> A few more, I mean, more specifically into uh, one issue that comes up in, uh, right away in my discussion of what I call existential limits, which again is about our relationship to the given world. Okay, so I'm going to go to the next slide. Does anybody know who this Greek mythic figure is? Anyone seen this cap before? What's that? Prometheus, Prometheus yes. So Prometheus. Uh, was a non-Olympian god, a titan, um, who uh, stole fire from the Olympian gods and gave it to humanity, right? Uh, and so, seems like a nice guy, uh, <laughs> humanistic, uh, we might say, uh, often taken to be a sort of great humanistic figure. And so what's the significance of this? Well, fire transforms things, right? Uh, you know, human beings can cook their food, right? Uh, they can make metals, so all kinds of things uh, central to human existence, or what we consider human existence today are shaped by this you know, simple thing, fire, right? So uh, Prometheus has become this sort of figure of a certain kind of ideal of a civilized mode of existence, uh, sort of the advance of civilization through science and technology, uh, so people often, you know, refer to a kind of Promethean ideal, a Promethean project, right? Uh, now, Promethean himself was a Greek god, uh, but it's usually taken to a, as an idea of a playing god, that a, a Promethean, a Promethean uh, ideal is an ideal of playing god or seeking mastery over the given world, right? And so uh, to take up a Promethean project is to take up a project of mastery, right? And this is really as old as humanity, that human beings have, have sought to master the world, right, in certain ways, right? Um, but there are questions of what are the limits on, those, on mastery? I mean, if you think about the biblical account where God gives dominion to human beings and there's sort of discussions in theological circles about how we're to understand that dominion. We see this in the Greek mythology here with Prometheus, a certain kind of ideal of mastery. Going back to the biblical uh, text, you might think of the Tower of Babel. Uh, that's obviously seen as going too far and seeking a kind of dominion, trying to build a tower to heaven, right? To be to be on a par with God, right? Um, so there's been, you know, this is sort of an ambivalent thing <laughs> in our humanity, right? It seems both good. You know, we think of like you know medical technology that's both good, but also bad. I mean, I think there's lots of discussion about this today with the pandemic. Uh, you know, I won't get into all the political hot button issues on this, but uh, you know, how much can we master the world? Do our, does our attempts of hubris cause more problems? Um, but it is, it is part of, we've all benefited greatly from science and technology, but we also are maybe ambivalent, especially about technology, maybe the role, for instance, of things like phones, and uh, yes, it helps us to uh, communicate better than we've ever had before, it eases communication, Yet, human, you know, young people are lonelier today than, you know, they've been in past generations. What's going on? You know, so we, we have to reflect upon these things. And so, um, so in, the, in the book, I take up, uh, I argue against this Promethean project of seeking a kind of unlimited mastery over the world. So how do we sort of put the brakes on this, this idea that we can be sort of masters of the universe, that uh, as one of the characters in... Um, Shakespeare's The Merry, Merry Wives of Windsor put it, uh, the world is mine oyster, right? It's, it's sort of, it's all there before me, it's up for grabs to do with what I will, 
right? And so it's all about sort of imposing your will on the world, right? To, to, to sort of align it more to your desires, right? So that it can fulfill your wishes, right? And so this is expression, or it's at least, um, it's at least a certain direction of a certain kind of posture towards the world that I explore. So as you see here up on the screen, uh, I, I explored what I call two fundamental existential stances. So again, existential here just has to do with our stance towards existence, uh, or as I put it, our orientation toward the given world. So all human beings, all mature human beings, take up what I call the choosing controlling stance. This is part of being human, that we make choices, uh, we try to control the circumstances of our lives. Much of this, I think, is very good. Um, and so we do it in an effort to improve our lives and our world and the lives for others, right? And in doing so, we seek to uh, control, transform, and overcome the given, right? There are things like diseases, right, that we should try to eradicate. <laughs> there's, no, there's no point in accepting that. I mean, we should try to do our best to, to alleviate disease. Um, now, are there limits on that? There may be. I mean, you will, I, I talk some about uh, genetic engineering. Uh, you know, should we... Should we have designer babies in which, uh, you know, sort of in a petri dish that we sort of pick out, uh, you know, and, and uh, today the, the technology is this gene editing technology where we can edit genes, and so uh, with this Casper uh, Cas9, uh, CRISPR Cas9 technology, uh, in, in increasingly, although you know we, we haven't yet gone full bore with this, it seems increasingly possible that we could design future generations of human beings. How do we feel about that? Um, should we put certain limits on that? Even though it may serve certain beneficial ends, is that a good thing to do? It raises that question. Those who are sort of really gung-ho about that take a very strong choosing controlling stance, right? And so uh, this can go at the extreme, this stance can become this Promethean project of seeking uh, kind of unlimited mastery over the world, right? Or at least close to a kind of unlimited mastery over the world. Many people, in point of fact, do recognize, for instance, limits, at least based on other people's autonomous choices, right? Uh, so they're not full-blown uh, Nietzscheans, if you know the philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche, who I also discussed in the book. He thought, it was, he thought basically uh, happiness, as he put it, was the feeling that power is, going, is growing, that resistance is overcome, right? So he has this ideal of self-overcoming, always seeking to overcome resistances, limitations, so it's about expressing our will to power, imposing our will upon the world and shaping it sort of as, as we want to shape it, right? Nietzsche was not a fan of human rights and, you know, sort of egalitarian type of concerns, uh, so he really recognized, you know, basically no limits other than what he, you know, uh, the limits of his own power to impose things on the world. So, um, so there, there are, I think, important questions there. But, uh, while I think all people do adopt this choosing controlling stance to some extent, uh, we also, many of us, if not all of us, will also adopt an accepting, appreciating stance towards the world. That there is a point for simply accepting the world as it comes and appreciating it. And if we do so, this is going to impose limits on what I call the choosing controlling stance. So just take, for instance, a relationship, right? If you're in a relationship and you're always trying to control the other person, to shape them who you want them to be, the relationship is probably not going to go very well, right? Um, there has to be some place for a kind of accepting and appreciating people as they come, right? Now, that's not to say you think of like a parent, right? There's a kind of relationship that a parent has to their child. They, they love their child for who they are, but they also want to encourage their child to become the, the best of themselves, uh, to, you know, to achieve their goals and so forth. And so, uh, again, there's, you might say there's a kind of way that we need both, right? How, and how do we get it right is the question, right? Now, you might say maybe the goal is just a kind of balance, right? So some people who would say, well, we need a little of both. So maybe it's kind of like, you know, we have roughly even amount of both in our lives, you know, some place for choosing, controlling, some place for accepting, appreciating. Then, you know, then we're fine. It's, it's good, right? I actually reject this approach because I, I want to argue that the accepting, appreciating stance is in important respects more fundamental, that it's, it has, has a greater primacy. It's not, again, to deny a place for the choosing, controlling stance, but it needs to be informed by a proper accepting and appreciating stance. So I give three sort of arguments along these lines. Um, so these, these pictures all have sort of relevance. Um, 
This is uh, Lilies and Birds. Anyone know the reference? It's from the Bible, the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, Jesus says, do not be anxious, right? Uh, Consider the lilies of the fields and the birds of the air, air, right? Neither do they toil, nor do they spin, uh, depending on, I think that may be the King James Version. Um, So uh, this is sort of a representative, I think, uh, metaphorically, of a kind of accepting, appreciating stance, right? Uh, Do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will take care of itself, is another uh, thing that Jesus says uh, in that that passage of the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, Seek ye first uh, righteousness, uh, and all these things shall be added unto you, right? So it's kind of like, well, don't worry about all these things. Just do the things you need to do, but also be at peace with the world, right? Okay, so um, why, why should we regard the accepting, appreciating stance as more fundamental or, or more primary? Now, I'm going to go on to talk about these six limiting virtues, which I think give a proper expression to these two fundamental stances, uh, and particularly that you know, that this accepting, appreciating stance is, is more fundamental, as I'm saying. So it's not, they're not sort of separate. These stances, I'm saying, well, they at least shouldn't be separate. So again, it's not a matter of balancing. It's a matter of how should a proper accepting, appreciating stance inform the choosing, controlling stance. So first of all, I mean, this is a very basic point, but we first need to appreciate what's the value in the world if we're going to know how to act, Right? So if, if we're going to know how to act well, we have to have habits of appreciative attention to what's good in the world, right? Uh, there's a philosopher I really like, uh, Iris Murdoch, who says our, our ability to act well when the time comes depends upon our habits of appreciative attention, right? So we have to, we have to cultivate practices of contemplation. So contemplation, as I understand it, is just appreciative attention to something of value, right? So we have to have a kind of receptive posture towards the world, first of all, right? Another philosopher who I like says that um, um, response, not fiat, is the prime gesture of the human person. This is a, a Hungarian philosopher, Kolonai, uh, Oral Kolonai says that response, not fiat, is the prime gesture of the human person. So we don't just will, but we will in responsiveness to something of value, right? Otherwise, it's not clear why our willing matters at all, right? Um, so our willing, our choices seem to, the, the, the value of our willing or even our autonomy, right? We talk a lot about autonomy today. Um, uh, I think we shouldn't be autonomy-centered in the sense of it's all about my autonomy because autonomy itself, its value is derivative upon there being things worthy of our choice, right? Autonomy is just our capacity to, to make choices, right? To make our own choices. So. Um, but our choices could be good or bad. And uh, the value of you know, choosing depends upon there being things worthy of choice. If there's nothing worthy of choice or nothing worthy of desiring, then as one philosopher, David Wiggins, puts it, a new disquiet assails our desires. Why desire anything, right? If, the, if, it's, like just, if it's just a bunch of valueless stuff in the world that we have, some of it we happen to desire, some of it we don't, but it's just a matter of what we happen to desire, we can always stand back from those desires and ask why we should care about them. And if there's nothing we can say about their objective importance, then we may in fact find ourselves with nothing to will, right? So if willing is all there is, and there's nothing it's responsive to, we may find ourselves in a debilitating condition in which there's nothing to will. And in fact, it's interesting that uh, I, in the first chapter, I talk about Nietzsche, who talks famously about the death of God, um, you know, he, he you know, says basically, he, at least in his view, we, we can't believe in God anymore. I think that's obviously a contested view. But um, first of all, he has this experience of, of vertigo or, or a sort of disorientation where it's like which way is up, which way is down. Um, he, he sees it as a kind of threat of nihilism that like, okay, then <laughs> what should I choose? And his solution is to play God and to just, you know, impose our will upon the world. But the challenge there is what I'm saying, you know, if there's nothing of value, in the world, nothing of, we might say, intrinsic value, uh, you know, inherently valuable, then uh, why should we will anything? I mean, he has this sort of discussion of yes saying to the world, which I, I, I find uh, attractive. We should say yes to the world, at least, uh, you know, many aspects of it. But uh, if there's nothing worthy of value, if it's all just our willpower, then it sort of deflates the importance of, of willing or of choosing, right? 
So in that sense, that's a sort of basic point about like what gives our choices value. They're derivative upon there being things in the world of value to which we can be responsive. Right? So my view, again, of the virtues is it's just modes of proper responsiveness to what's of intrinsic value in the world. So that's, that's the first point, uh, uh, sort of, I think, fundamental kind of idea that, and I think, in point of fact, most people probably do recognize things that they think are just inherently valuable, and that's why their choices uh, really matter to them. That's why you know, claims of conscience are very important. So, okay, so the second reason that I, that I want to talk about here is that given the limits of our existence, we are never going to achieve a state of perfection, right? Whatever sort of perfectionist ideal that we might hold, uh, we are never going to achieve it uh, through our efforts. And so we need some way of living with imperfection, uh, which means that we need a way of coming to see life in the world as worth affirming, uh, as good and worth affirming despite the ill, despite the evil and suffering it contains. I call this the problem of cosmodicy. Some of you may be familiar with, uh, you know, in philosophy religion is what's called the problem of theodicy or the, the, the task of theodicy is to, is to justify God's ways uh, in the face of evil and suffering. So the classic sort of version of this is why would an all good, all powerful God allow for evil and suffering in the world, right? Um, there's different responses people give. God wants to give us free will. God wants to, you know, to undergo a process of soul making, or you know, there's a number of you know, people debate those whether they're adequate response or not. We won't get into that today, but um, I think that there's the, that problem is actually downstream from this more fundamental problem, what I call the problem of cosmodicy. And this is a problem for everyone, whether you believe in God or not. Sometimes people think the problem of evil is just a problem for people who are religious and believe in God. In fact, it's a problem for all of us, <laughs> you know, that, that there's evil and suffering in the world is something we all confront. We can all ask the question, is it good to have been born? Is it good to be here rather than to never have existed, right? That's all, a, you know, for all of us, that's a question we can confront, we may, especially in, in the face of hard times that we, that we may have gone through or are going through or will go through. Uh, we all confront that question, is it, is it good to be here? So cosmodicy, uh, refers to justifying or defending the world, right, or life in the world. Is it good to have been born? One of my favorite novels is The Brothers Karamazov, and one of the characters, Ivan Karamazov, he brings up all the suffering and evil in the world, especially horrible things done to children, and he says, well, it's not so much God that I reject, but it's the world <laughs> created by God. Now, he actually does reject, I mean, I think he is an atheist, but uh, he, the point is, he, more fundamentally, he rejects the world, and so he says he's going to hand back his ticket uh, to the world, which sounds like suicide, right? Um, so that's, you know, that's a question, not to, you know, it's a, that's a very serious matter, um, but it is something we all confront. It's part of being human that we, we can, we rise to self-consciousness, reflect on the world, and we can ask, is it good to be here? So part of what I'm saying is that it, the part of why we need to cultivate an accepting, appreciating stance is we need to find a way of being in the world where we can accept and appreciate the world as it is and find it meaningful. Now, perhaps, you know, people might come to a judgment that it's not, but that would be a, a very sort of bad place to be in. My point is we need to find our way to that affirmation of the world that's good. So again, this is, you know, where I agree with Nietzsche, who I mentioned earlier, talks about yes saying to the world, saying yes to the, to the world. But for Nietzsche, that was all about will to power in the face of it all. You know, I'm just going to, it's the ultimate expression of the will to power. What I'm saying is, no, we actually have to find our way to seeing the good in the world, looking for the good in everything. It's a certain kind of posture. Not that we ignore the bad or we don't seek improvement, but we need some way in the midst of trying to seek improvement to realize we're never going to achieve perfection. There's always going to be evil and suffering as long as we're on this mortal coil, to uh, quote Shakespeare again. Um, and uh, so we need some way of being at peace with the world, right? Uh, I'll come back to talk about that more. I'll come up with, as we look at some of the limiting virtues, like the virtue of contentment, uh, we'll talk about that further. Lastly, uh, with, with regard to these three reasons, another reason why the accepting, appreciating stance has to be regarded as more fundamental is that... Um, our, our achievements themselves are not really complete without our appreciation of them. So in a way, appreciation comes first, as I said, 
uh, in the first point, that we first have to appreciate what's of value to know how to act. But in another important sense, appreciation also comes last, right? That it's, we have to find our activities worthwhile. We also have to have ways of just appreciating our lives, our activities, the world around us, right? So this is uh, where I, you know, why I conclude with a discussion of the Sabbath um, as something that, you know, whatever people's religious or non-religious beliefs might be, uh, we need some way of appreciating our work and thereby completing them. So it's very interesting in, in the Genesis story, the, the first creation story in Genesis, God creates the, so it's seven days of creation, famously, right? Um, but it seems like the creation, the work of it, right, just takes place in the first six days. But significantly, God completes the creation on the seventh day by resting and appreciating the creation, right? So the Sabbath, the practice of the Sabbath is meant to imitate, obviously got the seven days of the week, imitating the seven, you know, in our, in our culture, um, you have the seven days of the week and you rest on the seventh day, right, to complete your work the other six days, right, uh, to appreciate that work and, and your, your, your place in the world, right? And so the Sabbath, uh, you know, I think it actually helps with all of these points that, it, you know, in, in the Sabbath we engage in contemplation, in the Sabbath, we recognize that we're not going to achieve unlimited mastery. We stop working for a day. Now, this is, again, I think very countercultural today. How many people stop working for a day, you know, let alone the weekend? Um, and then uh, we also, you know, appreciate the work, the work we do, right? Um, uh, and the world around us. And so in that sense, complete the work uh, you know, we both imitate God in, in the Ju Jewish and Christian traditions by our creative activity, so that is important, right? But we also complete it by resting, and it has the added significance that for human beings, <laughs> this is a kind of practice of humility, that we aren't masters of the world, that we have to cease our activity and rest, right? Rest, I think, especially for college students, is not always easy to come by, right? And so we need practices of rest to say we're human beings, we're creatures, we're not machines, right? Uh, and we have to rest and just appreciate the world around us and the work we're doing, but by resting and engaging in contemplation or appreciation. Okay, so those are my sort of three kind of big reasons around why I think this accepting appreciating stance is more fundamental. Again, it's not to say that we shouldn't take up the choosing controlling stance to improve our lives, but uh, adopting the accepting appreciating stance in the proper way is how we know when and, and how to take up uh, the choosing controlling stance. So it, in that sense, it informs how we should make choices, how we should engage and seek uh, improvement in our lives. Okay. So I'm going to now discuss these six limiting virtues. So that would be sort of the last part of my, my presentation here, my talk, is just to, to kind of go through and talk about each of these, uh, what I call the limiting virtues. And so part of my argument here is that uh, You'll agree with my argument if you, if you think that these are, are really virtues. Like if, if you're convinced that these are legitimate virtues, they all give, I think, proper expression to these two fundamental existential stances, uh, especially the way in which the accepting, appreciating stance is more fundamental. Uh, and so what I'm trying to give is a sort of integrated vision of the good life, trying to give you a picture of what, is it, what, is it, what it is to live well as human beings uh, and the conditions we find ourselves, and especially with regard to this, this issue of the place of limits in a well-lived human life. Okay. So the first limiting virtue is humility. Now, I regard this as the master limiting virtue. Now, I, you know, I'm kind of critiquing mastery, so I, I was like, it's, it's like the chief or like the best or like the, the one that guides all the others, right? It's, or, or the others sort of find expression in the virtue of humili humility, right? So, what's that? Cardinal. cardinal. We could call it card. Part of the issue is there's like traditionally is there, there's the cardinal virtues and you know like uh, going back to Plato, you have uh, justice, prudence, uh, temperance, and courage. So, anyways, I was struggling for the term. Anyways, I just went with master virtue, you know, because I'm not against you know some some mastery. I think that's that's part of the mastering our character. But in any case. We can call it a cardinal virtue, we can call it a master virtue. It ensures, the point here is that it ensures that we recognize and live out our proper place in the world or in, in the scheme of things, right? 
however we characterize that scheme. Um, and we'll see, I think it's, it's closely connected with the virtue of reverence, which helps us to recognize that proper place in the scheme of things. Um, as, it, as a limiting virtue is especially concerned with reigning in what I describe as this Promethean tendency to play God and seeking mastery over the world, uh, which I've said is a prominent tendency, in, especially in the modern world, the scientific, scientific technological mindset. You can see this especially in Francis Bacon, sort of the beginning of sort of the scientific revolution, Descartes. Both of them sort of give strong emphasis to this idea of, of mastery over the world through science and technology, especially science in their age. Um, so the virtue of humility recognizes that some things must be accepted and appreciated as given and not subject to human control or manipulation. It properly acknowledges our dependency on others and on the natural world, as well as on values or, or goods not of our own making for living well as human beings. The virtue of humility also properly recognizes our natural personal and moral limita limitations. It owns up to them. It, it knows one's limits, and it lives within those limits. Right? Um, Martha Nussbaum says, Hu hubris uh, is sort of the, the failure to recognize what kind of life you've got. It's a human life, and you have to live within uh, human limits, not try to be something other than you are. Right? That's in her essay called Transcending Humanity. So the virtue of humility, you can see, is obviously you know, the crucial virtue here. Um, because it, it's, it's sort of a proper recognition of limits in sort of a, a wide scope, right? Uh, traditionally, this has sort of been, you know, framed in terms of situating ourselves between the beasts and the divine. You see this, uh, Aristotle doesn't, he, he, uh, he's, he talks about magnanimity, but uh, he doesn't talk about humility, but there was a lot of concern in Greek literature about hubris, um, of trying to, to, to be uh, godlike in an improper way. Now, Aristotle does think we should aspire to be godlike in contemplation, but he, he recognizes we're never going to, you know, achieve, given the limits of our humanity, we're never going to achieve sort of full sort of godlike perfection in contemplation. So um, I think an important thing to see here is that humility is not, sometimes people uh, characterize humility as a kind of self-abasement, where we sort of grovel and think that we're like, you know, uh, despicable and lowly and all these sort of things. I think that's actually not to recognize our proper place in the scheme of things. Actually, St. Thomas Aquinas talks about how the virtue of humility has to be paired with, with magnanimity, sort of a greatness of spirit. So we both need to recognize our greatness, but also our limitations, right? That, that we do have, you know, uh, something great in our humanity, but we're also not gods, right? Uh, so humility and, and magnanimity have to go together for that reason. Okay, so that's, that's humility, and as I said, I think this is closely connected with a second limiting virtue, which is the virtue of reverence. The limiting virtue of reverence is um, concerned with being properly responsive through reverential behavior and attitudes toward what is reverence-worthy. So uh, that may, you know, we may think of human life as something re reverence-worthy, God, uh, the natural world, right? So a lot of environmental concern today uh, a, lot, a lot of ecological discussions talk about cultivating reverence for the natural world. Uh, another way to think about this is just in terms of uh, another word you might use for reverence is piety. Uh, piety obviously has certain religious connotations, but people also refer to a kind of natural piety. So piety uh, oftentimes is directed towards the sources of our existence. So for instance, filial piety, which is really emphasized in the Confucian tradition, but also in the Jewish and Christian Traditions, you think, you think about the Ten Command, one of the Ten Commandments is to honor your father and mother, right? Your parents are a source of your existence, or your ancestors as well. This is obviously very big in, in Confucian thought as well. Um, but um, then we can think about, as I said, natural piety, but there's religious piety. Uh, so piety usually is sort of giving reverence to the sources of our existence, but I think broadly could just be understood as a kind of reverence. Um, so the, the reverence, you, you might think of... Um, maybe to kind of take it out of the, the religious sphere a bit, for those of you who maybe don't resonate with that part, uh, some of you may, um, you know, is a kind of heightened respect, right? Uh, respect, you know, reverence and respect are, are pretty close, but usually we, we invoke the language of reverence when we're talking about something that's, you know, ha has great dignity, right? Is, is really worthy of our respect, right? So it's a kind of heightened respect, as I say. You know, some people talk about the sacred or the holy, right, as another way maybe of getting at that, that heightened sense of respect. Um, 
so uh, I think I think it anthropologically it's the case that most people would probably recognize something that they might call sacred or reverence worthy. There may be even many things that they would call sacred or reverence worthy. I think, for instance, human life is sacred, uh, is worthy of a kind of reverence. It puts certain limits on our will, right? So in recognizing the sacred or the holy or something of great dignity, we're recognizing something that puts limits on our will, right? There's a kind of non-trespassing that, that, that it signals, right? There's certain ways we're not to uh, trespass against that sacred or dignified thing, right? And so the, the virtue of reverence is a mode of being properly responsive to the sacred or the reverence worthy or that which has great dignity, right? So, um, and I think that informs our, our proper humility, right? To, to, we're humble when we recognize there's things of great value beyond ourselves, right? The unhumble posture is to think, I'm the master of the world, I can do what I want, the world's my oyster, it's an irreverent stance, but when you have reverence, you recognize that you're not the master of the world. There are things of value beyond yourself that constrain your will and to which you need to be responsive. So I develop an account, uh, a Confucian account of the role of reverence and character formation. So uh, in the Confucian tradition, there's a uh, discussion of uh, the, 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 the term is li, but translated oftentimes as ritual or propriety. Even good manners might be a way you put that. So in our day-to-day -day interactions, we can act in reverent or respectful ways towards others, or we can act irreverently or disrespectfully towards others, right? And that shapes our conception of other human beings as uh, worthy of value, right? That we're recognizing their value. Um, or we can become blind to it if we have manners that are disrespectful. We become blind to the value that, that we can find in the world. And so uh, I, just, I developed that idea of, of character formation, especially drawing on Confucian sources there. And they also talk about absolute prohibitions. But I want to go on. So as I said, humility and reverence are closely connected uh, limiting virtues. OK. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to speed things up here a little bit. So moderation uh, is the third limiting virtue. Um, moderation is a limiting virtue because it's concerned with avoiding vicious extremes. Now, if you've ever read Aristotle, in a way, all of his virtues seem to involve moderation. That's also true of, of Plato, that they, it seems to be, they're, they're really concerned with his art of balance, right? That the virtues of character all concern what he calls a medial condition, or sometimes it's called the golden mean of trying to sort of hit the mark between an excess or deficiency in some feeling or action. So again, take generosity. Generosity is the mean or the medial condition uh, between uh, sort of a stingy person who doesn't give. You might think of like Ebenezer Scrooge here, at least in most of uh, uh, Dickens' story. Uh, he learns generosity eventually, but um, he's too stingy. Right? Then you could also go too far and be excessive in being wasteful or, or, or giving sort of indiscriminately in a way that doesn't actually help people. Right? So the virtue of generosity gets it right in, in the action of giving. Uh, it gives in the right way to the right person, the right amount, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, it's the person of practical wisdom who knows how to get it right. Courage is another example where uh, it's a mean between uh, the excesses of fear, uh, which would be a kind of cowardliness, and a deficiency of fear, which would be a kind of rashness, right? So moderation seems to be, in one sense, again, uh, uh, a master virtue or, or uh, a cardinal virtue of some sort, uh, but with regard to the virtues of character as a whole. Um, so uh, I do, dis I mean, so oftentimes we think of moderation and temperance as, you know, essentially the same. Uh, but temperance really concerns sort of like sensual pleasure, uh, pleasures of touch and taste and, and, and those sorts of things. Um, and so I, I discuss the role of, um, of temperance, uh, moderation as temperance, when I talk about character formation, that part of what we need to do is relate, you know, to, 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 our, to pleasure in the appropriate way, to take pleasure in, in noble things, uh, not to just be sort of uh, purely pleasure seeker. So Aristotle thought happiness was not simply found in the pleasure seeking life, but rather in a life of what he called eudaimonia, which means a kind of uh, happiness in the sense of like a noble, fulfilling human life, right? And so we have to take pleasures in those things that elevate our humanity, that help us to be the best, the best that we can be, right? So in that sense, temperance is important for making us properly receptive to those things that are really ennobling of our humanity. 
But then I also discuss moderation uh, as a political virtue, uh, that moderation uh, avoids vicious extremes. So we live in a sort of polarized age, and so moderation seeks to be, uh, seeks to fi find a way to deal with th those conflicts in political community. Uh, I won't get into all the details, we could take that up in, in uh, discussion, but um, political moderates often have to stand, have to be contrarians, that they're, they're in a way, they have to go against the crowd. We think of sort of what we call political tribalism today, where people all line up on one view and hold, you know, like on a host of controversial issues, except a whole platform. It's not always clear why they, they all fit together, but it's more like team sport or something. And so the, the political, the person who practices moderation doesn't mean they might not be on one side or the other of a political divide, but they, they seek to find common ground. They, they, they try not to be uh, sort of Manichaeans where they, this is, uh, a, means basically seeing one's own side as sort of a force of goodness and the other side as a complete force of evil. You see, well, probably all sides have some point and, you know, like uh, we have to try to uh, bring out the good and avoid the bad as best we can in an environment where people disagree on what those good things are and those bad things are and maybe we have some agreement, some disagreement. And so it's, it's more of a posture towards dealing with uh, that disagreement and trying to avoid a kind of extremism that makes the sort of whole political project uh, come apart, right? All right, so I don't wanna go too far on that, but we, we could take that up more in discussion, but I do apply moderation as a limiting virtue to limit our tendencies towards extremism and the sort of extreme partisanship. Um, okay, so let me head on to the last two limiting virtues and then we'll, we'll go to discussion. So this picture is uh, of, uh, some of you may have be familiar with the Grimm's Brothers fairy tale, The Fisherman and His Wife. It's a, uh, it's a tale about contentment. Uh, the fisherman catches this fish who, who is a magical fish who talks. He says, well, that's interesting. He says, please don't eat me. And he says, I'm not going to eat you. You're, you're a talking fish. Uh, and so, uh, but he goes home and tells his wife about this. And she's like, you just caught a magical fish. Why didn't you wish for anything? And so, she, you know, they, they live in this sort of... Uh, it's a little hut that's kind of dingy and squalid. Uh, I think in maybe the original translation, the, the word is piss pot. It's part in the French, but uh, but that's that's the essential German term for it. Uh, not not a great situation. She wants a nice cottage. That seems seems reasonable. Um, but she keeps sending him to go back uh, to get more. And she ultimately wants a palace, and then she wants to be the pope, and then she wants to, you know be the emperor, and on and on. Eventually, she's upset that the sun and moon uh, rise and fall not at her command. <laughs> and so she wants to be as unto God, right? And so at that, you know, the fisherman keeps finding something, you know, disturbing in this, and, and you see a kind of disregard of the fisherman, you know, as she, as she increases in power. Um, and so it teaches us something about the insatiability of human desire, especially towards wealth, power, status, um, and um, so content, and, and the fisherman keeps imploring to contentment, right? Um, and it, interestingly, when she wishes to be God, the fish says, go back and you'll find her back in the hut, <laughs> you know? And so there's a kind of interesting interpretation there that maybe we're like unto God in a sort of proper godliness sense when we're content, right? Uh, when we're content with our lot. There's a, there's a passage from the Talmud that says, uh, who is rich, he who is content with his lot, right? Now, uh, the, the limiting virtue of contentment, as I call it, uh, as I describe it, is the virtue of knowing when enough is enough, of being properly satisfied and not wanting more than is needed for a good life. It doesn't mean we don't seek improvement. There are places for being discontent. And you might argue that having, living in a, uh, again, pardon the French, a piss pot is, not, is something you're not gonna be altogether content with. That, you know, people want good living situation, they should have enough to live well, right? So the goal here is not minimalism, but rather it's sufficiency, right? What we want is enough, but it's problematic when we seek to always get more and more. And so for instance, this is the problem with, I think particularly in our culture with this sort of ideas of status and always trying to get, you know, advance yourself in this way or that way, uh, get more and more, right? It's never enough, right? It, there's, there's never enough you can get. You're never gonna be satisfied. And so again, this goes back to that point, we need to live within our limits, even with imperfection. We need to find a way, as I put it, to be at home in the world amidst imperfection. And so this 
requires that we adopt a, you know, a, a grateful or appreciative orientation towards the world. Uh, to first count our blessings before we try to go, out, go about seeing what's wrong with the world. There are things that are wrong, there are things to make, ways to make things better, but it's a kind of orientation or posture towards the world that we first seek to count our blessings, to find the good, uh, and to be content uh, where, where it's appropriate, where it's appropriate to say, you know, I have enough, right? I have sufficient. Uh, and this goes back to Aristotle's idea of, of happiness, uh, the good life, is a life sufficient unto itself. So the idea that, you know, we should always want more and more money for Aristotle was just insane. It was, it was like, you don't understand. The, the good life is, you know, the life of virtue where we're being properly responsive to what's of value. And, uh, you know, that's sufficient unto itself. We don't need more and more, right? Um, so this goes into my idea of home economics, that, you know, the goal of economics should not just be to acquire more and more. He contrasted a koinomia with the art of acquisition, which was just to get profit. And he said the people are just concerned with profit. They're serious about living, but they're not serious about living well. Because he thought, again, living well was a life sufficient unto itself. So, um, anyways... The virtue of contentment, I think, is a very important virtue that we're not always seeking to maximize, right? Uh, the virtue of contentment says that it's better to satisfy than to maximize, right? Uh, we shouldn't always be seeking to maximize. Sometimes we want to make things better, but we should seek to find the sufficient. Okay, so I will turn to the last... Actually, I, oop, I clicked off. What did I do? All right, wrong button. Sorry, I have two last limiting virtues. <laughs> real quick, I'm going to do these real quickly. So... Neighborliness and loyalty. This is a picture from Van Gogh of, of the story of the Good Samaritan. So this gets to the point about um, how far should we be expected to go in doing th good things for others, right? I would acknowledge, I think, the virtue of neighborliness acknowledges that all human beings have a basic dignity. We owe some basic concern, right? But we are limited beings. We're place beings. We live in a particular place, and so how should we think about that? So the limiting virtue of neighborliness I describe as a form of human solidarity that recognizes the moral pro significance of proximity, your, the closeness of someone. It stands opposed to impartialist moral theories such as utilitarianism and Kantianism, which do not recognize the moral significance of proximity. Peter Singer has a famous article on, on famine relief where he basically says, you know, it's a prejudice to, to recognize proximity. However, um, you know, this has been a big part of Western culture, if you think about the teachings on the love of, love of neighbor, both in, in the Hebrew Bible and the New Testament. Uh, you think, for instance, of the story of the Good Samaritan. Our neighbor whom we are to love is not just someone who lives nearby. So in a sense, it's, it's universalized, right, the neighbor in that story. But it also recognizes the importance of proximity. So we're to love anyone, including strangers, who we encounter face to face. So one way to put this is that uh, it recognizes the significance of concrete rather than abstract humanity. And there's a danger in just purely abstract humanity that we will love uh, people in general, but no one in particular, right? There's you know, some famous expressions of this, such as uh, Dickens, where he talks about this character's telescopic eyes, where she's always looking far off at the distant lands, but neglects her own children. Or uh, William Blake says, you know, the general good is the plea of the scoundrel. Whoever would do good to another must do it in minute particulars. We must do it into the concrete human beings. Because, in fact, concrete human beings are imperfect, and we ourselves are imperfect. It's not always easy to love and care for the people who are there in our lives. We can have grand ideals by which uh, we come to hate humanity because we have those ideals. I just think, you know, for, go back to the partisan issue. Uh, people have these high, you know, ideals of justice, but yet they hate viciously people who disagree with them, right? How are you going to live in a society, you know, if, if people all hate each other, who, people who disagree with them, right? And so uh, I think a kind of neighborliness, if we get back to just encountering people as concrete human beings, uh, I think this would go a long ways, uh, you know, personally, but also uh, in, in our political lives. And then loyalty, just uh, the last limiting virtue here, um, this is a story of the prodigal son, Rembrandt's painting of the prodigal son. Uh, you know, the f sort of father's loyalty to his wayward son. But loyalty, um, w w so the point is that when we come to love those who are there in our lives, we're going to form bonds of loyalty. We're going to recognize demands of loyalty that recognize the good we've received from that relationship, uh, but also sustain that relationship going into the future, right? So it's a kind of partialistic 
attachment to some where, you know, for instance, to family, to friends, uh, fellow citizens. Um, now, you could talk about loyalty to humanity, right? But then, you know, there's a place for loyalty within that. In fact, I talk about a kind of loyalty to the world as such, as opposed to other, this is part of my existential stances, that we need to be loyal to the world, uh, to, to the, what's of value in the world, rather than wishing for some other world, right? Which is always going to be fostering discontent. And so uh, loyalty is a, is a proper response to particular value. When something has value, it makes demands upon us. If, if it's something with which we can be in relationship, it makes demands upon us and, and puts limits on the extent of our attachment. So uh, obviously, I think patriotism is, is, a, is an example of loyalty, more controversial. There are concerns about how loyalty can be used to sort of cover for wrongdoing, right? Uh, my response, I think it has to be compatible with the other virtues. <laughs> that virtuous loyalty has to be compatible with justice, has to be compatible with reverence, and so forth. And so, um, so patriotism is not incompatible with wanting the best for your, for your, um, for your country. Uh, G.K. Chesterton said, uh, someone who says, my, my, my uh, country, right or wrong, is like someone saying, my mother dr drunk or sober. Uh, no doubt you'll stick with your mother and help her out, but it's, uh, you know, it's, you know, it doesn't mean you, you don't sort of try to, try to seek improvement. So anyways, I'm going to stop there. I went a little longer than, than I anticipated, but uh, I, I want to uh, leave some time for questions. But thank you for listening. Hopefully it's been interesting and thought-provoking, and I look forward to hearing some of your questions. So thank you very much. who wanted their students to take attendance here. There's a little sign-up sheet uh, at the desk as you walk out the door, so just be sure to sign that as you leave. Um, we have about 14 minutes for questions. Comments. A lot there, so you should be. Yeah. What's the mask roll with a Uh I mean, maybe leave it on, actually, okay. if that's OK with you. Very good. Just because you're not going to be like, you know, I just okay. for everyone else to say. So I'm going to try to be Benjamin Farrington for five minutes. Okay, I don't know. Uh, don't take five minutes, though. Be Benjamin <laughs> Farrington for, for, for okay. like two minutes. Okay, so let's say that, uh, that, that Elon Musk succeeds in flying us to Mars, whether we like it or not. Yeah. Okay, and we're there. And we're going to say, okay, we need some air to breathe, so we need to make some air. Uh, we need some water, we're going to stay warm, so we're going to have to split some atoms. Okay, and so there is no living nature there. We're in our ongoing existence is of necessity going to be fully Promethean, right? Or pretty much. I mean, pretty much. Are there other human beings, or is it just yeah, you? Well, just us right now. I've said it more, but so. Yeah. Others, are, that. others are placed limits in yourself. Yeah. You know, yeah. yeah, but um, yeah, but we're going to have to. Promethean-ish. Yeah. yeah, we're going to have to engage in techno, right? Yeah. OK, now we'll come back here. And once we're here, uh, the, it's pretty much the same thing. The salient difference is we've built out our infrastructure further. Yeah. So uh, we're already well along the Promethean path. And so my question would be, if that's so, uh, uh, doesn't the uh, account of limiting virtues presuppose the built-out infrastructure? <coughs> I mean, sort of civilizational infrastructure, like all the technology and science we currently have, and is that what you're saying? Yeah, even beans in a tin can. Yeah. Uh, that, in a sense, we already have this uh, web of technology that supports us. Yeah. And if we already have that web, then uh, we're not in this Martian situation where you know, we have uh, the immediate need to engage in in techne, which would probably be integral to our telepathy, in the yeah. sense that we're continuing. So, uh, you know, it, it isn't uh, Promethean behavior on the part of humans part of our basic telos? Yeah, I mean, it depends. I mean, so I talk about a Promethean ideal mm -hmm. that's like a kind of unlimited mastery, right? And so the question would be like, so I'm not, although I do have some. Luddite tendencies, I think it's fair to say. Luddite is sort of a, a, a term, someone who's like anti-technological, right? 
at least have worries about technology and how it sort of reshapes our lives. I think there's always a danger in the kind of reshaping, like what might this new technology mean? Oftentimes it means many good things, but I, uh, I'm more of a mixed baggist. Of, I'm, okay. I'm just a mixed baggist about life generally. Uh, I don't have a sort of, I'm not a sort of a utopian, we're on a march of progress to like some state of perfection. Neither am I kind of like we're, we're in a march of decline, right? Life is full of good things and bad things. And the question is always, how do I use this bit of technology? Or what's the proper use of it? Uh, and what's, um, what's uh, the improper use of it? And uh, same with, with you know, science and, and medicine and so forth, right? Um, so it'd be, it'd be sort of a question of like, what goods are lost, right? Now, so for instance, just take something like cell phones, which people talk the smartphones. In many ways, they're very good, but there may be a place where, like, uh, I know some restaurants now are like, you can set your smartphone up in a certain place, right? Um, and, uh, you know, you put limits on how much you use it, right? Or you can, like, track your screen time usage, right? And so it's like, how do you use that in a way that facilitates the goods you want to achieve, but doesn't prevent them from being achieved, right? Um, so it isn't sort of preventing of achieving our, our human well being, right? So I don't know, I mean, if people are like really lonely today, I mean, you might, might be debated about what causes that, right? Uh, but if it's like, you know, kind of, if like all of this sort of interaction is never at a level of depth where people really get to know one another, right? Well, then we may have to rethink it and say, well, maybe we need to put limits on our use of this technology to foster these goods, right? Now, uh, I talk about, you know, genetic engineering or gene editing in, in the book, and there are some people who are all, all gung-ho on it, of that, I myself am, am against it. Uh, I think it. I think it distorts so the proper parent-child relationship, where you no longer see a child as a gift to be accepted, but rather you see the child becomes a product, right? So it sort of changes the very nature of the relationship, and something that I think is a crucial human good. You know, there are people who are trying to extend the lifespan as long as possible. Some people who hope that we could eventually sort of cure the ultimate a uh, disease of aging, right? Uh, would we want to live forever? You know, in this sort of earthly condition. Um, it's not, you know, are there maybe certain blessings of immortality, or sorry, of mortality, right? That our lives are limited, that it gives a kind of significance to our activities, that, you know, gather you rosebuds while you may, old time is a flying. If you guys know Dead Poets Society, you may know that reference. Um, so, I know, I think those are questions that should make us reflect on, on what's, what's good. And what, what, how, how might it facilitate the good? How might it prevent it? So I don't want to give a kind of, yeah, we, we are in the midst, right? I think that's right. I think we live in the midst of all kinds of scientific and technological advances. And that's always been the case throughout human history, right? And the task for us is how do we, how do we live well in relation to that? So these limiting virtues are, are, are ways of trying to focus our reflection on how do we live well in the world as we find it, not wishing we were somewhere else, but how do we how do we how do we live better? So, uh, and do you want to do the questions? Ahead, yeah. Please, yeah. Yeah, I'll make it brief. I see other people have questions. So, um, just um, thank you for your talk. I yeah. really enjoyed it. Um, so, I guess the the um, the examples from the examples that you tie the uh, limiting virtues to are, um, are are traditions with with grand narratives where things bind together into a kind of vision of, of the good life yep. or, you know. So um, in an age where, you know, where we live in an age of sort of blasted al allegories and blasted narratives, and so uh, your book is, is calling us back to some pretty old virtues which are tied to grand narratives which are, they don't have a hold on the majority of people, people of different, you know, so there are many people who have different narratives and so forth, right? We live in a pluralistic world in that regard. So I guess the question that I would have is, um, to what degree do you think uh, sort of maybe a, a recapturing or a, a renaissance of some of these limits and virtues you're referring to, to what degree can a, a sort of reinvigoration of these limits uh, together compress a, a narrative which is not an old narrative, not necessarily a, a, an old-fashioned narrative, or bring us back to the fold, so to speak, yeah. but to be part of the construction of a new narrative. Because the narrative of technology and the consumer market is not really a narrative in that older sense, and it certainly doesn't preach about limits. Yeah, that's a really interesting question. Thanks. 
I mean, I don't think I don't think it's the case that many people live without <clears throat> grand narratives. I think actually most people do. Um, well, I mean, just take like some of the religious traditions I appeal to. I mean, I mean, maybe in the academy, you know, it's not the case that most people are religious in any traditional sense. But certainly throughout the world, most people are religious of one form or another. And so it's actually, um, I think academics tend to be Promethean figures. <laughs> they, they tend to, you know, I can see above it all and, let, you know, like, uh, be above the fray in some uh, certain kind of way. But oftentimes, I still think there are like these grand political narratives, narratives of progress. And if you don't have them, then you know, like every election can be a source of despair or something like that, right? And so I actually think it's pretty hard to live without the narratives. I think it would be uh, a sort of despairing kind of condition to be storyless. Uh, I think part of so in my in my first book, the virtue virtue and meaning, I developed developed this account of being the meaning-seeking animal. And I think part of that is also being a meaning-seeking animal is we're also storytelling animals and we tell, that's how we make sense of our lives is in terms of stories. And um, So I think it's hard to live without them. That's why I think I, you do need sort of these cultural reference points, you know? So I mean, I kind of appeal to Judaism, Christianity, Confucianism, Greek mythology, right? Um, I think those are important. Um, you know, I think, it's a really interesting question because like this idea that we can construct our own narratives may itself be a kind of Promethean kind of project, right? That it's like, it's everything can be constructed. Like again, the world is sort of our oyster to kind of make of it what we will. Uh, I think oftentimes many of us just find ourselves in narratives. We're, um, as the philosopher Michael Sandel puts it, we're encumbered selves, right? We're not disencumbered, but rather we find ourselves in, in families and traditions and cultures and it has a sort of binding. And I think to live without that actually is a kind of like, uh, I think this is why sort of questions of identity are so much stronger today is because I think, I think you are putting your finger on something that, that our, I think our sense of our stories, our narratives being in a plural culture are more fragile. Um, and so I, I do think there's a potential crisis around that. Um, but you know, I, I talk, when, I, when I get into talking about humility and reverence, those are virtues particularly that have a kind of religious connotation to them. I think a lot of people would, would sense that about those and, and they are traditionally, I think religious have been tied to, because you know, human beings throughout history have been religious uh, oftentimes in one form or another. Uh, you know, today you could call, talk about certain secular religions and you know, something that's a, a binding sort of narrative and ethos. And um, I do think if, if, if humility and reverence aren't virtues, I think we're in a really bad, place, uh, that there's nothing worthy of our sort of reverence, nothing of great value. I, I, think, I, think there, I think that's a question today that in a way it wasn't in the past. And I think with, without that, I think humility is not a virtue, if reverence is not a virtue. And so I do think it falls apart if there's nothing worthy of reverence. But what I'm saying is that we're, in a, we're in a pretty bad state if that's true, you know, so um, so we have to find our, whatever our way is, we have to find our way to the kind of reverential posture towards the world, which is much more difficult today, I think. Yeah. So David, I want to take two more questions, but I also yeah. recognize that some students are going to want to have, run to the next classes yeah. so as to not be late because the campus is Absolutely. quite large. Um, so if you are one of those students, go ahead. You feel free to leave, but go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, I was just wondering, so you said a lot of this was contradictory to utilitarianism. Yeah. So I'm curious if you think that limiting, Thank you, trying to limit our virtues prevents people from, as Peter Singer would say, doing the most good that they can. Yeah. Um, good. Yeah. Yeah, I'm pretty anti-Singerite. Uh, and, and a number of, <laughs> on a number of levels. Uh, I mean, I think there's something admirable in, uh, you know, what, obviously, like, benefiting, uh, benefiting sort of the poor around the world is, in many respects, a good thing, right? You know, Peter Singer will acknowledge he himself doesn't even live up to his ideals. That's not, I'm not, you know, calling him a hypocrite or anything. He actually does quite a bit. Uh, he gives quite a bit of his salary away. Um, my point uh, is that, there are many good things in life, and we talk about the most good you can do, right? That utilitarian sort of assumes there's like um, kind of one kind of good maximizing pleasure, minimizing pain, or some people talk about preferences, right? Maximizing preferences. 
And so it has a kind of monistic view of value. Right? My view is that there's many good things and many bad things, and those good things can't all be achieved together, and the bad things can't all be avoided. You know, it's a, we have to use our practical wisdom to know how best to act. Right? Now, part of my argument against someone like Singer is, is in line with um, Bernard Williams, that I mentioned earlier. But there are certain kinds of projects and relationships that make our lives meaningful, significant. He calls it ground projects. I don't know if you're, you're familiar at all with this, this kind of argument, but um, that we can't undermine those, right? They're, they're part of what make our lives worthwhile. And so, you know, any kind of concern for humanity as a whole uh, can't be self-defeating, right, uh, in that way. But that doesn't mean that we couldn't all do something more, you know, or like, um, that maybe there is more that we could do. And I think one of the things I like when I teach Singer is I think he sh he's good at making people feel uncomfortable. Like, well, maybe you don't need that extra, you know, whatever it is, right? Maybe we could be more generous, right? Um, you know, and uh, so, yeah, I mean, I, I think I, I, my emphasis on beginning with um, sort of concrete humanity, caring for those who are there in your life, but it should extend beyond that, right? Uh, and it's difficult to give a kind of, Part of the problem with, I think, both utilitarianism and Kantianism and these questions of what we owe to other people is that they make things too easy, right? But they it's sort of you have to bite a lot of bullets. So for instance, you know, utilitarians is just they give you one kind of thing you're to promote, and then you just maximize it, right? But the problem is there's many things that are valuable. If you just sort of in that sort of monomaniac kind of way, just go at one thing, you're gonna lose a lot of other things of importance, right? Uh, maybe undermine the very thing you're trying to achieve by making your life seem, well, what is it about, right? John Stuart Mill famously, you know, had his, his, had his crisis, you know, at age 20. He's like, even if I achieve perfect happiness, you know, what, what would life be worth, <laughs> would, if, even if I promoted this perfect condition, would life still be worth, worth living? Kant, on the other hand, he, he calls, you know, duties of assistance imperfect duties, right? That they're, they're sort of encouraged but not required, right? Now that seems like, you know, in one way, it's not as stringent and it gives us a place for something that's praiseworthy but not required. But there are cases where we feel like, no, it's like not just like encouraged, but like take a good Samaritan type situation where someone's like wounded and you, you know, you're like, uh, is it a, are you just encouraged to help them, but you could pass by on the other side? No, it seems like we actually are required, right? And so I'm, I'm more of a particularist about, um, you know, our, what our obligations are. I mean, I think there are universal obligations, but they tend to be negative in nature, like not violating people's like, basic rights, you know, transgressing against them. But I think there are cases where we are strictly obligated to help. Um, so it's hard to give a, <laughs> uh, give a sort of straightforward, like, okay, here's, here's the answer. I think you have to look at each circumstance and the circumstances of your own life. It's a very Aristotelian answer, basically, and determine what's, what's the proper way to live as a person who wants to have generosity, who wants to be just, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Have loyal, have friendships, um, yeah. Does that, does that kind of get at your question? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, Singer, Singer's a great challenge from my view. I mean, because he's not a limits guy. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. It's a great question. Thank you. Uh, do you have, yeah. Yeah, I was just going to make a, make a comment that, that um, your, your uh, limiting virtues opens a great uh, discussion for the interaction between them. Yeah. Okay. So, because I'm looking at contentment. Yeah. And right below contentment is neighborliness. Yeah. So um, I can say, well, I'm perfectly content. Uh, and so, since I'm content, I really don't care if down the street, yeah, there is somebody yeah. else who isn't receiving the same set of uh, rights and access to yeah. the world's resources yeah. as I am. Yeah. Uh, and so, um, uh, so, uh, and then my other reflection was that, uh, to me, contentment is a form of moderation. Okay, um, so that's why I say when I look at down 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 the list, uh, that there's a great way, you know, what you produce is a is a is a great uh, discussion forum to sit down. And maybe you maybe you cover some of them in in the in the book, but yeah. uh, you know, in, in in the pursuit of w what these limiting virtues are, uh, and 
understanding them as a as a scale. Yeah. Okay, so I was going to tap into, yeah. uh, among other things, Aristotle's always says that there are uh, antithesis that yeah. are antithesis, and, you, yeah. and your your change is along I those. The mark, yeah. Yeah, and so in each one of the, in each one of these, eventually developing thinking about a scale. Yeah. Um, yeah. Anyway, so that was just kind of what, yeah, what my I, reflection was on it. Yeah, and you know that's that's something. You know, I, I could could hear and maybe even the book have gone further in, um, but I do think I am a I'm a unity of the virtues guy. <laughs> is that I think they have to be related. Uh, so I think there is going to be a relation. Right. So contentment can't be the virtue of contentment can't be what you described it as, where it causes us to neglect our proper concern towards others. So yeah. failing in neighborliness, as you were saying. Right, and in, in your discussion yeah. was the, the virtue of being contentment with 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 material resources. Okay, yeah, exactly. And that was one form of. Yeah. But but my becoming perfectly happy in yeah. in my material resources. But I, my material resources are because of my my social my social economic gender circumstance, and so I'm I'm content with this. And so in the meantime, in, in the in terms of neighborliness, I'm falling down on neighborliness because I'm not making any type of effort to to consit to contribute to the contentment or to the yeah to the contentment yeah. to allow others to receive a level to to get to a level of contentment also. Yeah. Um, and and so and then also in terms of historically, the damage that some of these have been done. Yeah. You know the you know humility. Okay. Uh, slaves, you've got to be humble. Yeah. Okay. Um, it's and, not humility, oh, my oh, view, but... oh, and slaves, you've got to be contentment because yeah, contentment yeah. is yeah. is a virtue, yeah. and so you've got to be contentment while I, as the slave owner, am making my wealth over you, off 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 of you. Yeah. So the issue is historically, uh, um, historically, each one of these yeah. have a have some horrible, horrible social social impacts to to shape the thinking yeah. of certain segments. Yeah. Of the of the population, well, I think guys, we have we've given we've given David more time on his feet than we anticipated. It, so I can certainly respond. Yeah, please do, this, yeah. please do, and then we'll yeah. then we'll have to call it a day. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, it's a great question. Yeah, I mean, I think this is why it's important to think well about these virtues. I think it's right. I think it's true of any virtue. Any virtue can become a sham virtue, where you use it for sort of oppressive right. oppressive ends, right. right? Where it's actually a vice. Um, so contentment is knowing when enough is enough, right? right? right. Uh, I also develop a sufficientarian account of justice, where what we owe to people is to ensure that they have enough to live well. Uh, so, you know, I mean, that, that's another kind of issue, but I think it's closely connected with, with contentment. Um, and people can claim justice and, you know, murder millions of people in the name of some, you know... As we, as we know. As we know. You right. know? And right. so, uh, this is why I think it's important to, yeah, be aware of those pitfalls, those dangers that... Uh, you know, for instance, humility, it's important, it's not self-abasing, it's not, it has to be paired with magnanimity, a sense of the greatness of our humanity, mm -hmm. right? But also to not think that we're something other than human, right? So what we don't want, we, we don't want dehumanized humanity, but we also don't want, you know, uh, if you accept humility as a virtue, you, you uh, reject the Promethean a pro project of unlimited mastery, right? That we can right. pretend as if we're God. I actually don't think it's a very good <clears throat> theological view that I think God, is, uh, should be understood as recognizing limits, uh, the values that there are in the world. So the historical backdrop for this sort of modern Promethean project is really interesting because it starts with sort of like in the late medieval period, there's sort of this debate about uh, voluntarism, about is something good just because God wills it? So the traditional natural law ethic that you would have saw in something like St. Thomas Aquinas, so that God wills something on the basis of a perfect understanding of what is really good, right? Whereas, you know, Scotus and Occam, late medieval philosophers, they said, no, it's, you know, we got to give God this perfect freedom. And here, freedom is understood to do it whatever you want, right? So right. God becomes a kind of Promethean right. figure. That went along with this sort of nominalism, which shaped the rise of modern science. So I think you know, there's a kind of interesting story to tell there about how this Promethean, pro and many people have told some version of this story. Right. Um, but, uh, yeah, so anyways, I, I think... 
the point is to, to recognize limits properly. And so a lot is built into right. the properly. So there's a virtuous mode of well, doing and, it. Right? And what I would yeah. say that even the Promethean virtue yeah. is, uh, I, I agree that the Promethean, and the gentleman back here was talking about, oh yeah, well you can, you can you can condemn the Promethean as long as we're walking into a heated you know a nice heated building that that we you know where where we have where we have control we have learned to control nature we understand uh, and and then recognize that the other side of the Promethean issue is that that uh, Promethean uh, who are pursuing to make wealth at the expense of and now all of a sudden we're not in control of the, the universe around us because of, of the, uh, because of somebody who steps forward and says, I'm going to dominate the world for my own self-interest. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so anyway. Yeah. So it's, I think this is, yeah, how do we think about, it's not that we don't try to seek improvement. Right. That's what we're calling right. Promethean. Right. The Promethean. There's the ideal, which is like to be godlike right. in a certain understanding of godlike, which I want to reject. But I'm not rejecting the effort of seeking improvement. And there's two sides to the Promethean myth also, yeah. which is, as you point out, Prometheus says, oh, this wonderful thing called fire and all the advantages it can give, yeah. the gods are holding on to it and not allowing humans to have it. So I'm going to give the good yeah. side to the fire, OK? and. Uh, you know, so you you alluded to, you alluded to that. Uh, yeah. So the and so the issue is recognizing that uh, that there are people that there that there are there is this human tendency for one group of people to take, to take advantage over another another group of people. The fire is an ambivalent power. One way to frame it, you know, right, right, like yeah. Promethean fear that when we play with fire, we might get burned. Right, yeah, yeah. The and, Frankenstein and it, worry, right? Yeah, and many yeah. houses burning down. Yeah, shows <laughs> shows the downside. Yeah, cli climate catastrophe or so whatever. I, I, two things. I want to. I should say that I lived yeah. with a. I lived among a, a tribe when I was eighteen. The oh, Osmond, cool. and and literally, this was a, a a group of people who didn't know how to make fire. Anyway, oh, really? Um, yeah. But so I, I guess I should go read Prometheus again. It's been a while. It's been since high school. Um, but I want to get a round of applause and before we don't have yes. an audience. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you. Stick into the bitter end. <laughs> for, for those uh, of us who have a flat bowl, yeah. Great questions. Uh, Great attendance, too. Oh, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. I've had a turn. Nice to meet you. Is it very cool? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, cool. Promethean um, Wonders. Network. Yeah, well, yeah. Recently, I've been talking to you. Yeah, I've been talking to you. Yeah.